Hey guys, I thought we could still do our technique sessions by doing these voiceover PowerPoints. If at any point you have any further questions, feel free to contact me on Canvas or send me an email um, and we can discuss any of the stuff further. Um, before we actually get started by talking about the ultrasound of the pancreas, I think we should really focus on the anatomy and physiology. Uh, remember with the pancreas, it's a retroperitoneal organ other than the tail, but when we talk about it as a whole, we talk about it as being part of the retroperitoneum. And we break the pancreas up into five different parts. We have the head, the uncinate process, the neck, the body, and the tail. When I actually have a diagram of the pancreas, I will try and point those out to you and I'll point them out on ultrasound as well. Um, when we talk about the head of the pancreas, it's located in the C loop of the duodenum, which can make it quite tricky because bowel, gas, and ultrasound are not friends. The other relevant anatomy that we have in the pancreatic head, which we can identify on ultrasound, is the gastroduodenal artery, which is seen anteriorly in the head of the pancreas. And then posteriorly, we can see the common bile duct. You guys have already been practicing elongating the um, bile duct into the pancreatic head. So that should be no surprise to you. The uncinate process is a posterior and medial projection from the head, and it lies posterior to the superior mesenteric vein and anterior to the IVC. We have the neck of the pancreas, which is seen anterior to the portal confluence, which again is where the splenic vein and the superior mesenteric vein join together to form the main portal vein. We have the body of the pancreas, which is seen anterior to the aorta and posterior to the stomach. And finally, we have the tail, which is lateral to the pancreatic body and extends to the hilum of the spleen. The ampulla vader is where the bile duct and the pancreatic duct enter the duodenum. The duct of Worsung is the fancy name for the main pancreatic duct. Duct of Santorini is an accessory duct that can enter the duodenum slightly higher than the duct of Worsung, and the sphincter of Audi is actually the muscle that surrounds the ampulla vader that is going to control the flow of the pancreatic juices and bile um, from both the pancreas and the biliary system. It's important to remember that the pancreas is both an exocrine and an endocrine organ. The exocrine portion of the pancreas is carried out by the acini cells, which help create and release pancreatic enzymes to help our bodies digest food. The endocrine portion of the pancreas is carried out by the islets of Langerhans, which are made up of alpha, beta, and delta cells. The alpha cells create and release glucagon. Glucagon is a hormone that actually helps raise our blood sugar levels by having glycogen be converted into glucose and released into our blood. The beta cells help create and release insulin. Insulin is a hormone that helps lower our blood sugar levels by having our cells uptake the extra glucose and store it in the form of glycogen. And then we actually have our delta cells and our delta cells help create that homeostasis when our blood sugar is at a good level and it doesn't need to increase or decrease, it is um, somatostatin which gets released. When we look at the lab work for the pancreas, we're often looking at things like amylase and lipase um, and glucose as well. It is really important that we know in a case of acute pancreatitis, amylase is going to be the first um, lab level that is going to increase, but it will go back to normal. Lipase, however, will increase as amylase increases, but it will stay elevated versus amylase could go back down to a normal level. And then glucose will just help test to see if anyone, if our patient has a metabolic disorder, such as diabetes. Why are we going to be doing an ultrasound of the pancreas? Well, we could be looking for signs of acute or chronic pancreatitis. We could be looking for distal biliary obstruction. 
We could be identifying pancreatic masses depending on a patient's symptoms. They could be having pain, specifically back pain. Um, they could have things like um, jaundice. So we're looking again for that obstruction. Or we could be identifying an, any other epigastric mass. Um, what is important to note is that when we are looking at things like acute pancreatitis, we actually, first of all, can't diagnose this on ultrasound. You could do an ultrasound on someone who does have acute pancreatitis and their pancreas looks completely normal. When we have a requisition that asks us to rule out pancreatitis or that is querying pancreatitis, we are trying to identify the cause of pancreatitis. So we're looking for those obstructions, we're looking for stones. Keep that in mind because this is where when you do that scan, it is important that you do everything you can to show the bile duct is normal, the pancreatic duct is normal, there are no gallstones, um, all of those things. When we look at the pancreas, um, it typically appears hyperechoic to the liver, but it could also appear isoechoic. You'll see on all of these images, the pancreas doesn't stand out too well, and that's actually because it is not an encapsulated organ. As we get older, the pancreas tends to become a bit more echogenic because it stores more and more fat. And then we have the pancreatic duct, which should actually never measure anything greater than two millimeters. The reality is on ultrasound, um, our resolution is getting better and better so we can typically see more than we used to be able to. It's quite common that we can see the pancreatic duct but again it should never measure greater than two millimeters otherwise it is considered dilated. When we do an ultrasound of the pancreas it is important that we remember all of the structures that surround the pancreas. Because of its location a lot of the pancreas can and does get obstructed we have the head of the pancreas lined in the sea loop of the duodenum. We know that gas and ultrasound are not friends. We have the stomach, which lies anterior to the pancreatic body, and the tail can actually go quite deep, and so it can be really, really hard to see. When you first start scanning the pancreas, what I recommend you do is break it up into the different parts. And actually, I still do this because I really want to solidify and be sure that I have done everything I can to view all of those individual areas of the pancreas as best as I can. I will always try different breathing techniques, such as having my patient take a big breath in, potentially pushing their belly out. Um, I might even just have them breathing normally to see if that helps. Another thing that becomes really important is my ability to push I can often push bowel gas out of the way, but it includes and requires quite a bit of pressure on my end as a sonographer. Um, there's another trick that we can do to try and move that bowel gas out of the way, which is having our patient prop themselves up on their elbows and having them take a breath in. This, unfortunately for our patient, is really uncomfortable. So if it's not working, let them lie down. It's much easier for them. Um, as a result of the stomach being seen anteriorly or positioned, sorry, anteriorly um, to the pancreatic body, what we can sometimes do is have the patient drink some water so that the stomach can fill up with fluid and act as an acoustic window to let us see through to the pancreas. If I am doing an ultrasound and I'm having a really hard time seeing the pancreas at the beginning of, this, of my scan, I will take representative images of whatever I can see. I will sweep through the anatomy that I can see of the pancreas, but then I will do the rest of my exam and come back at the very end. There's always a chance that as I've had my patient turning up onto their right side and on, the, on their left side, as I've had them taking in bigger breaths, potentially coughing, whatever it may have been, that bowel gas that was obstructing the pancreas could have moved and I could have an increased chance of being able to see it now. It takes me about 20 seconds just to look to see if my window is any better. And if it is, great. I will then take those images to prove that the pancreas is normal. Again, I just want to remind you guys that it is so important that we document what we do and do not see. It is so easy to miss a pancreatic head mass or a mass in the tail. 
because it was obstructed and we didn't document it and we called the pancreas normal. I'm going to ask you now and I'm going to continue to ask, how can you call something normal if you have not seen it? Um, our interrogations. Whenever I am scanning any organ, um, and not even just me, everyone, we need to be sweeping in two planes. Um, what I do when I am in trans is I actually break up the pancreas into different areas. I will first scan through the unscenting process, the head and the neck, and then I will look at the body and the tail. So whenever I do my transverse sweeps, as I've said multiple times when we scan things like the kidneys or the gallbladders, um, is that I try to start superior to that organ and then sweep inferiorly. So I'll first put my transducer down, I will figure out the lie of the pancreas, and then I will optimize my window for the head, the unsinate process, and the neck. I will then start superior to my pancreatic tissue and I will sweep until I sweep all the way out through it, and then I will go back up superiorly and sweep through it um, again. So those are my two sweeps in my transverse plane of my head, my neck, and my unsinate process. I will then go and optimize my image for the pancreatic tail and body, which means I'll probably increase my depth a bit more because that pancreatic tail um, can be quite deep. And then I will again start superior to all pancreatic tissue and sweep inferiorly all the way through the tail and then sweep back up, making sure that I'm not missing anything. I will then go in long, and this is where when I go in long, I'm going to use the anatomy that I know. So when I'm trying to identify where my head is, I'm going to think, what does the head fit interior to? I know because of a, a relational anatomy, sorry, that the pancreatic head sits interior to the IVC. So I'll probably go, I'll identify my IVC in long, and then I'll find my pancreatic head anterior to the IVC. I'll then make sure that I sweep out laterally, so I'm starting all the way outside of that pancreatic tissue, and I will sweep through from the head of the pancreas all the way through the tail, going all the way out of all that pancreatic tissue, and then sweeping back from the tail all the way through the head and out. Once I'm done those sweeps, I'm then going to go and take my images. We've already talked about this. Remember all of those small little techniques that can help you see the organ. Try different breathing techniques. Try angling either superior or inferior. Potentially you might get your patient to fill their stomach with some fluid. Or you might just come back to it at the end of the exam. If you've done all of these things and you still can't see the pancreas, it comes down to documentation. The required images for the pancreas are three in trans. You're going to take one of the full gland, you're going to take one that is optimized for the pancreatic head, and you're going to take one that is optimized for the pancreatic body and tail. I personally take longitudinal images of the pancreas, um, and I take one of the head and the tail, but that is specific to me and not specific to all sonographers. Um, you will see a lot of people do different things, and you will take what you like, and you will leave what you don't. The end goal is that we find the pathology, and that we answer the clinical question. And that is all. I hope that you guys found that helpful. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me.